gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Good evening. You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. We thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoy another exciting episode of our show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. It's the Six Man Dean Geronimo. It's March 8, 2021. Man, I'm just waiting for some warm weather to come through and something to happen because uh, this winter, man, somebody find the groundhog and um, give them a two-piece or something because we didn't ask for all of this. But anyway, in the news, man, we're going to just get into a little bit of news right now. Um, Derek Chauvin's trial... The jury selection was delayed today, but the judge said it will start tomorrow unless an appeals court intervenes. Now, potential jurors in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was sent home Monday as the court grappled with an appeal over the possible reinstatement of a third-degree murder charge. The judge said he plans to move forward with jury selection Tuesday unless an appeals court steps in. Chauvin is charged with second-degree murder and manslaughter in the death of George Floyd last May. Prosecutors contend Floyd, 46, was killed by Chauvin's knee, compressed against Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes while he was handcuffed and pinned to the pavement. The legal experts say bystander video of the incident, as well as two autopsy reports, will play central roles in the trial. The question at the heart of the case is whether what people saw on the video was murder or a terrible tragedy. Now, three weeks have been set aside to choose the jury. The opening statements have, were already scheduled back in March. Now, as far as the latest updates, the defense and prosecution team struck more than a dozen potential jurors Monday. And I take that back. Opening statements are scheduled for March 29th, so that's at the end of the month. But Hennepin mm-hmm. County District Judge Peter Cahill ordered potential jurors to report 8.30 a.m. Central Time Tuesday, with jury selection expected to begin at 9 a.m. Now, earlier today, K. Hill recessed court while the prosecution asked an appeals court to say whether jury selection must be halted, while the defense asked the state Supreme Court to review the third-degree murder charge. Prospective jurors were sent home for the day. Derek Chauvin appeared in court today. Bridget Floyd George Floyd's sister and founder of the George Floyd Memorial Foundation was the Floyd family representative in court and she sat in the back. Now leading up to the trial there have been a handful of peaceful protests with a demonstration this morning at the courthouse and a vigil planned tonight at George Floyd Square. So you know (laughs) Floyd's sister thanks supporters she had a very very emotional day um at a brief press conference, she thanked the supporters outside of the courthouse. She shared a few, de- a few details about her experience as the first family member to sit inside the courtroom during the trial and also about Derek Chauvin. I sat in the courtroom and I looked at the officer who took my brother's life. I just really want that officer to know how much love Floyd had, she read from a prepared statement. Now, Floyd got emotional talking about her brother who she said was very family-oriented. I miss my brother George, she said. The officer took a great man, a great father, a great brother, a great uncle, and a great father. We would never get that back. Nobody from Floyd or Chauvin's family was in the courtroom for the start of the afternoon session. In the courtroom were the attorneys, Chauvin, the judge, court personnel, two deputies, two pool reporters, and Court TV's producer. The revamped jury box was empty for the afternoon session. 
With the normal seating and finished wood barriers have been replaced with office chairs spaced out with small portable desks before them. The attorneys and judges went into the chambers for a sidebar a little past 1.30 p.m. Chauvin looked at a headset in a plastic bag on the desk in front of him, but did not take it out. There are headsets at all of the attorney seats in case anybody wants to listen in or talk on a microphone that way. Chauvin displayed little, if any, visible emotion. A Floyd's sister walked in later. She sat in the back, hands crossed over the purse on her lap. The two sides discussed an array of emotions and struck 16 of the first 50 potential jurors. The jurors who weren't struck for cause were told to arrive at 8.30 a.m. Central Time Tuesday, with jury selection to begin at 9. Unless the Court of Appeals tells me otherwise, we're going to keep going, Hennepin County Ju- District Judge Peter Cahill said. Now, for several hours Monday, a group of more than 100 protesters demonstrated outside the Hennepin County Government Center. Artists and activists drenched flowers and mirrors in what appeared to be fake blood. As the crowd marched toward the courthouse, organizers encouraged the crowd to chant George Floyd's name and refrains such as no justice, no peace, how do you spell racist, MPD, and indict, convict, send those killer cops to jail. The crowd heard emotional speeches from speakers, including relatives of other black people who were killed by the police. All right. Um, Ibn Ed, he's like 20 years old, and um, she said her family, it's a female, was traumatized after a 23-year-old brother, Dolal Ed, was killed by Minneapolis police in December. She said she came to the courthouse Monday to fight for justice for not just my brother, but every black soul that was taken by a cop. And now that's a powerful statement. And hopefully this gentleman who decided to abuse his power and authority to take someone's life will actually pay the price for it. That is my hope. Um, And we'll see what happens. But anyway, from NJ to NC, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm in the studio with my right-hand man, Mark Lee. So, Mark, tell me what's good in your neck of the woods, my brother. Well, the weather is definitely improving. It's improving big time. So, you know, it's like it's around 60, and I think they're talking 70s tomorrow and all of that. So that's one thing that's improving is the weather is nice and lovely. So that's the improvement. I don't know about it uh, might not have been a big improvement with the dog fight that I heard in my uh, front yard earlier as I was doing one of my <laughs> you know, podcasts. I heard a couple of dogs that were maybe having a little bit too much fun with the weather and everything because they were growling at each other and hissing and making all kinds of racket and uh, did not walk outside, but it, don't, it didn't last long. So whatever was going on, it was a quick fight and it was an over fight. So it was probably just a lot of uh, dogs making noise just the way humans make noise sometimes just to be woofing for the sake of woofing and all of that. So that's wow. one thing that was going on. And then uh, that happened up in my front yard maybe about an hour, hour and a half ago. And of course, you know, always great to have and some great conversations going on on IBM TV. So had a leadership lady um, that was on on the uh, radio show and uh, that was Miss Julie Scott. So she's a coach and all so was talking to her and she talked about those people pleasers and we've talked about that even on this show so we know how those people pleasers can be and then I had Sandy Rodriguez and uh, Brad Dude and Brad Dude is about leadership as well and Sandy Rodriguez is out of California but originally from Mexico so she was uh, doing work in uh, that leadership space as well as uh, work as an amateur winemaker and a number of other things. She's uh, not you know she did not fit the stereotype of what people would stereotype a Mexican lady to be and everything. I'm thinking she's definitely taller than what the stereotype is, and she's got blonde hair. So, like I said, she did not fit the stereotype in the least bit, and she even said that she didn't fit the stereotype. So, that was an interesting conversation. We had a good time, and it turns out that she's into uh, heavy metal rock and some of the other heavier forms of music and all of that. So, like I said, it was a good conversation. Learned a lot about what she was about, what the other folks were about. And, of course, I was watching a little bit of my basketball game as, you know, we did manage to get to 500 to close out the regular season. And now we got to see if we can get above 500 by beating Georgetown in the first round on Wednesday, that being my Marquette Golden Eagles. But if we beat them, 
we get the right to play Villanova. So that might just knock us right back to 500 again. And of course, 14-14 and a whole lot of bad losses is not going to get you any sort of tournament bid of any sort. So I need some serious miracles happening in this week, like a four-game run. We got the players, we got some good players, but this year they were real sloppy with the ball. And you know, in basketball, being sloppy with the ball adds up to a lot of troubles because that gives the other team lots of easy points. So even though they had great athletes and some really good athletes and everything, we also had some that were a little sloppy with the ball. So I am fully not expecting a tournament bid, but you know, this could be a very unusual year, even in the sense of sports and all. Well, I mean, it's already been unusual with COVID and how they've had to deal with sports, but they're saying that this could be the first time, I think they said since 1995, that Duke will not be in the NCAA tournament because they have not been having a great year either as well. So wow. saying that, um, unless they make uh, some sort of miraculous run and, you know, run the table, which is all the time possible, you know, it's a new season. So all things are on the table in terms of possibility. But unless that miracle happens, this could be the first time since 1995. So we're talking 21 years plus five. We're talking 26 years ago was the last time that Duke was not in the, the tournament in one form or fashion. And I think they're saying that if Carolina makes it, they're only going to be like an 11th or 10th seed. So, like I said, this has not All been right. a typical right. year of ACC basketball, particularly here on Tobacco Road, because I don't even think the state will be a high-ranked seed as well. They might be like an 8, 9, or 10 themselves. So, like I said, this has not been a typical Tobacco Road-type season. Central would have to make a run as well because they have not had a good year as well. So, I think we both I was speculating that Norfolk State will probably get the MEAC bid, but you know, it's tournament time. So anything is possible. Any crazy things can happen. I know Liberty was almost knocked off by Northern Alabama. They did manage to pull it off. And I think that that, I'm not sure if that was their semifinal or their final game. If it was the final game, then they've got the automatic bid. But definitely folks are trying to get that automatic bid and all of that. And of course, everybody's looking for that similar check. I know I am. And they said that the house is going to pass it on Tuesday. And as soon as they pass it on Tuesday, they said it could be anywhere from two to three days that it could be sitting there in your account to be used by you uh, a little bit more than double what the last one was. I think the last one was around 600 and they're saying this one is supposed to be 1400 So they're saying that that stimulus check is supposed to be on its way, particularly after the vote is held on Tuesday and all of that. So that's some of the things that are going on in our world. And of course, folks are still trying to survive. Folks are still trying to figure out what they're going to do with school. Folks are still getting their vaccines. So a lot of the same stories in that sense. Of course, it is the International Women's Day, so we got to give a shout out to the women in our life as well as the women of history. You know, Dean, I did not know until recently that the laser uh, eye surgery, and I actually have a uh, cousin that had that laser eye surgery, was invented by a woman. And I saw that online recently as well, that that, that laser eye surgery was invented by a woman, so she's the one nice. that came up with that whole concept. Okay, that's awesome, man. See, you never know because people try to keep things, you know, like it just came out of nowhere. They won't tell you who had the thought and the motivation behind it, but when we find out, we find out there's some interesting, uh, you know, individuals who create these things that help folks. Me, I have readers, you know, reading glasses, so I don't have to wear them all the time. So, you know, somebody said, you ever thought about getting a LASIK surgery? I was like, nah, you know, my eyes are at that point. If they get there, then maybe there's something that may be considered, you know, but uh, it's been a very successful surgery for a whole lot of people. So salute to her for, you know, even creating that, man, to help people get back to seeing better and, you know, some people don't like glasses. Some people don't like contact. Some people don't like either one. So it helps them not to have to worry about that. And and they're back to how their vision was before they got to that point where they may have needed glasses. So shout out to her, man. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pull out what they said. And like I said, they gave it apparently, you know, a guy the credit for the full surgery, but, but I did pull up the notice about this particular woman that we have to thank for the laser surgery. It says, this woman invented an innovative device for laser cataract surgery. So Dr. Patricia E. Bath invented the device to change the way that doctors have treated cataracts. So we need to give a big shout out to Miss 
Patricia Bass apparently is one of those people that is needed to be known in history for helping us uh, folks that, like my cousin that got that laser surgery. So, like I said, there might be others that are actually given credit for the actual surgery and all of that. But in terms of uh, you know, procedure that lead to it, we have to give credit to Dr. Patricia E. Bad. She invented an innovative device known as the Laser Faco, which uses a laser to get rid of cataract. And in uh, definitely looks like she is uh, looks like she's a sister. So looks like a sister came up with it as well, and all of that. So whatever, we need to give major shout out to uh, Miss Bad. Indeed, man. And- we got a ring at the door, so we're going to find out who's actually behind that door waiting to get in. So we're going to find out who that is right now. Welcome to Straight Talk with Dana Mark. You are now on the line. Sounds good. Tell us who you are and where you're calling from. Hello, gentlemen. My name is George Foley, and I'm calling from Jackson, New Jersey. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. All right. Over there. That's out of right. Shore. I was going to you another New Jersey person. Oh yeah. <laughs> so George, I met you through the wonders of this lovely new website that I've become a big time fan of called Potted that lets folks know about that have stories to tell and things that they're interested in and all of that and definitely was uh quite interested in yours and then the fact that you were from New Jersey was a plus because even though I'm in North Carolina, my uh, tag team partner, Mr. Dean Geronimo, is up there in New Jersey with you. So definitely if you'll share a little bit about what you've got going on and why you're even were part of that platform and everything. And then we'll just go into a whole conversation about what you're involved with. Cause I know it's very much a thing that is needed at this time. Cause a lot of folks are thinking about housing and things of that nature, but I'd love to hear more about it from your standpoint. Oh, thanks for having me on the show again, guys. I greatly appreciate it. Um, long story short, I'm an author, entrepreneur, real estate investor, um, martial artist, martial arts instructor, um, you know, God-fearing man, you know, present father. I like to always say that because people just say father and dad, but they don't put any emphasis on it, you know, and I'm a present father, which means that um, I'm involved in my kid's life. I'm they see me in the morning when they wake up, and they see me when they go to bed, and I pride myself on that, being the son of a workaholic. So that being said, um, yeah, been in real estate investing now for almost 20 years, 17 years to be exact. I manage a small property portfolio in upstate New York, Rochester, where I graduated from high school, and um, been happily married now for 21 years. This August will make it 22 years. So that's a little bit about me and my background. Also, I'm a sixth degree black belt in ITF Taekwondo and a first degree black belt in Chondo Kwan Hapkido. And like I said, I've been training that now for over 30 years, been teaching for over 20, 20 years, 23, 24 years now. And still doing it. You know, as a matter of fact, when I'm done with this interview, I'll be going downstairs and get my workout in. So, um, you know, don't stop. That was great. Well, one of the things that you one of the things you just said that I know Dean would definitely appreciate as well, because he's always talking about his queen that he's had for a number of years as well. So I love that this is Women's History Month and definitely International Women's uh, Day and everything for you to talk about the importance of that queen in your life and uh, definitely what she means to you and all of that, and just the importance of women in your life, whether that's your mother or a number of others as well, because I know that while I am still the perpetual single person, I have got a lot of (laughs) lady friends in terms of people that I have mad respect for. And one of those being my mom, who actually, along with my dad, created a radio station some several decades ago, back in the late seventies in Warrington, North Carolina, that was on for about 10 or 12 years. And then of course she was also involved in the nonprofit world and the world of philanthropy for a number of years before retiring. And now she's just kind of enjoying retirement and all of that. But definitely, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the uh, queen in your life and what she means to you. Oh, my wife, we met in college back in 1997. So I'm kind of telling on myself a little bit up here at Keene University. It was Keene College when we went, and then when we graduated, I think uh, they changed the name in 1998, somewhere around there, 1999 to university. So Keene University is where we met. 
And, um, you know, she was a go-getter. What attracted me to her was the fact that she was just like me almost, going to school full-time, had two part-time jobs. I was going to school full-time, had two part-time jobs. And it was just, I knew that with my temperament and my mentality, I needed somebody to run with, not somebody to be subservient to me or be under me. I needed somebody to run with, you know, and she was that person. And I always knew that as I got to know her, that God forbid anything happened to me, my kids be all right. Come from a long line of strong women, strong, my grandmother on both sides of my my father's mother, my mother's mother, my um, my mother's God-fearing woman. I was raised in a Christian household, you know, and uh, my wife. And even we're instilling that in our daughter. So, yeah, you know, if it wasn't for praying grandmother, I wouldn't be here because Lord knows, you know, y'all remember 1997, 1998, what was happening over here? We was all running the streets. So it was crazy. It definitely sounds like you got yourself in that positive direction. And another thing that you are very much involved in is the whole concept of real estate. And we oftentimes talk about, uh, needing to have wealth that you can pass on, generational wealth and things of that nature. So I'd love to hear you talk about the importance of generational wealth and even how you deal with that when you're talking to your real estate clients. Because I oftentimes think that even in the 21st century, we don't have enough people paying attention to generational wealth or even maintaining generational wealth. I know that while I'm in an apartment right now, I have some family property that is definitely within our family and the, the plan is for it to stay in our family because it's got some good timber and no mom and her aunts were actually having a meeting with somebody that was interested in possibly buying some of the timber, but it was not going to be selling the land. If anything, we were just going to be selling the wood. But I would love right. to hear you talk about right. generational yeah. wealth and the importance of generational wealth. Well, I mean, it's absolute. It's absolute. You know, just from principles of the Bible, you know, our job is to leave something for our children's children, leave an inheritance, you know, and in our communities, you know, unfortunately, black and brown communities, we don't teach our kids at young ages about wealth and wealth management. And so that's what plagues us. I know that's what plagued me in my young adult life um, about wealth management and how to gain wealth. You know, my counterpart are teaching their kids about investing in stock markets. You know, first time I heard about stock market was glee in high school to a point that I understood what it was. And that wasn't even just an investment class. It was just a business class that I was taking, they were talking about stocks. You know, um, I was learn. I was taught wrong when it came to finances. So that's what I learned in my adult life. I had to unlearn a lot of things um, about finances, and and that's that's my journey into my books that I have written because of COVID. It gave me the opportunity to sit down and get these books out of my mind. Uh, my first book on resistance training, I started that about 17 years ago because uh, I'm a martial arts martial artist and an instructor. And even today at 47 years old, there's two questions that I still get walking into a gym or walking around is how much do you bench and what supplements are you taking? So, you know, that book was my journey all the way down and from that and teaching people the basics of what I've learned of working out, but specifically working out for martial artists. Um, you know, it's different if you're doing a bodybuilder, but if you're looking for white muscle fiber, fast twitch muscle fiber, uh, you know, action and reaction type force, this is more of the book for you. Um, my second book that I wrote was um, Property Management Basics for the Part-Time Landlord. And that book has probably been 10 years in the making because it was actually my sister, believe it or not, that finally told me, you got to write a book. Because literally to this day, I still get about five, six questions a day about real estate from property management to tenant management to funding to financing, everything. And it was just my journey. You know, when I started in real estate, Quora and Reddit wasn't a thing. Um, I had to figure it all out on my own. And it was hard. It was long nights of, you know, worry. And the reason why I say worry and concern is because, you know, we always get the stigma of slumlord, no matter what happens. And Mm -hmm. I've always prided myself on having real estate that I would live in. My family, me personally, would be willing to stay there. So that means when I fix it up, I'm fixing it up like I'm living here. 
You see what I mean? And that's what I've always wanted to try to pre- present. But when you have people that are jealous or I wouldn't say just envious of what you're able to accomplish and willing to tear you down, it's a concern because Mm -hmm. your name is still on that, so to speak. And so, you know, I had to learn how to live with that and manage that properly. I had to learn tenants and find good tenants. You know, I tell this story every time. I took a loss. And I took a loss in, the, in one of my units for thousands of dollars is when I didn't pay attention to some of the steps I put in place. A friend of mine, mm. I went to high school, I had to help him, uh, you know, or he needs help. And I'm just a sucker. Anybody that needs help, I will help you because I'm here today because people help me, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, I bend the rules a little bit. But because of that happened, I got taken advantage of. So I had to learn. You know, like I said, I'm 47. I had to learn at 44, 45 years old that I can't, uh, I can't negate my own rules. My rules are here to help me and protect me as well, too. And friend or family, they all have to abide by the same rules. So that was really um, the journey as far as my book. And my book literally is the beginning. I talk to you about LLCs. If you want to incorporate, don't want to incorporate. I talk to you about funding options. I talk to you about points for commercial real estate and residential real estate. You know, I talk to you about occupancy, um, meaning um, the funding is different if you're owner occupied, which means you're living in the property, or if it's 100% rental where you're not living in the property, it's 100% investment property. I talk to you about everything, even eviction, because that's another thing that a lot of books out there will say you can do, but nobody really gives you points on how to do it. And the purpose of this book really is to give some relief to some of the landlords out there for many of the questions that I've had for years. How do you get somebody out of your apartment, you know, when they haven't paid or, you know, you're stuck in the situation? It's just every county, every state is different. But if you know what to ask the right questions, and how to ask the right questions, you'll be able to navigate through that where you're not suffering with that burden of of having somebody live in your place, so to speak, and not knowing how to go through an eviction. Because what people don't understand, I know this is a long-winded answer. I apologize. This is my last point. What people don't understand is mom and pop real estate investors make up more than 50% of the real estate market. It's not the big REITs that have 100-unit buildings or 200-unit buildings or they're managing 3,000 units across the country. People like myself that have less than 10 doors or I'm going to just get this real estate as an investment. You know, they don't know how to manage it. They they didn't know anything Mm. about doing, you know, background checks for things about skip tracing, finding tenants after they destroy your property to be able to take them to court. You see what I mean? And that's really the purpose of this particular book, to help them with all the things that I struggled with over the last 15 years. And also, you know, my books really are a legacy for my kids, you know, because right now they're young, 9 and 13. I'm just dad to them. They don't understand the wealth of knowledge that I have. And so at some point in time, when they get to that point, I can just say, y'all don't want to listen to me? Read. <laughs> you see what I mean? And they'll have a little bit more respect for me in that in that uh area. Hello, am I still with you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um I don't know if Mark's phone had dropped off or anything like that, but you know, it it's interesting a lot of people are not aware of the next steps to take, like, especially if you own properties or something like that. And it's like shooting dice. Sometimes you have a family or individual that presents well, <laughs> and then you give them the opportunity to, to rent your, your place and something different happens. So now, oh yeah, you know, they want to oh, yeah. know what is the next step rather than, yeah, I have to go in and yes, I have to make these repairs. Yes. I do have to patch these holes in the wall. Even if I have to take a larger piece of wall out to repair what was done or the the fixtures of taking the loose or, you know, Mm -hmm. 
sinks damaged, toilets damaged, and then it's like, man, if you just wanted to leave, you know, just just pack your things and it would be okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I've said that time and time again. You know, I had a tenant actually took a box cutter to my kitchen cupboards and cut them up. Oh, wow. You know. And that was the thing that bothered me because I was like, whatever you're going through psychologically, all you have to do is leave, you know, destroying my place. And see, the thing, the reason why I included eviction is because I've probably gone through four to six evictions over the term. I would probably say um, from my rental history over the last years, 10, 15 years, it's really been about. I really had a, a, a hit or miss rate of about 90%. 90% of them were good, but that last 10% were bad. And mm-hmm. what people don't understand is that last 10% could make you mm-hmm. or break you. So that little month security deposit that you get doesn't cover that $2,000, $3,000 for damage you see when you walk into that apartment. Right. You know? And you you know it's bad when – you tell them you want to do a walkthrough and you don't get any reply back. You know it's bad <laughs> when you go to the mailbox and you see the keys to the apartment and they just poof, gone, thin air, you know. And so that's why I really added this eviction component because I wanted people to know the one thing that keeps people out of real estate is the fear of what's going to happen to them in there. What happens if they trash my pace? What happens if they're not, if they don't pay me? What happens if that and the third? And what I want them to know from this particular book is you have answers and you have the ability to be secure at night because you know what to do. You know, there's, there's nothing more satisfying. And I'm not, yes, sir. One of the other fears that people have, and you mentioned it with one of your other books, I wanted to get you to explore this as well is the, the fear, because I know it's one of sometimes a fear that even I have myself, is a fear of the credit ratings and how that can also put you on a path of uh, resistance as well. So I'd love to hear you talk about how you get away from the bad credit ratings to this path of debt freedom. Because I do know a lot of times, whether it's because of student loans, whether it's because of a number of other things, you do get concerned even with going for a house or even going for an apartment about the nature of your credit ratings and sometimes even in fact oh, yeah. jobs. Absolutely. You know, I um, mentioned credit and how credit works in my book on property management, but I actually even wrote a book. Uh, this is one of my f- four books, how to use your credit rating to help you to put you on the path to debt freedom. That's the title, how to use your credit rating to put you on the path to debt freedom. And this was something that I learned in my early forties because um, Like I said, I was taught wrong. I was always believed that all you have to do is pay your bills and you'll be okay. And that's what I did for 30 years. Never missed a payment, never missed a mortgage payment. Come hell or high water, I paid the bill. Even though majority of the time it was the minimum payment because that's just how I was moving. But that bill was paid. And I didn't understand how credit works and how underwriters see you and how banks see you and how creditors Mm -hmm. see you. I didn't understand about credit usage for personal use and business use. I didn't understand about um, debt to income ratio and how that particular affects you. Even though a lot of times when I got denied credit, whether I was buying a new house or I was putting something together, it was like, oh, your debt to income ratio is too high. You see what I mean? I didn't understand a lot of that. So once I was able to figure that out and, and learn that, the skies was the limit for me. I remember I was talking to an underwriter, and I kid you not, I said this story yesterday in an interview, and I'll repeat it. I was 10 years, I was looking for help and looking for credit. I got real estate, Mm -hmm. I have holdings, I have a net worth, I have all these things, and I just couldn't figure out why I was being denied or the funds that I was receiving were so minuscule and everything. And I'm just, I just can't figure this out, you know? And I had gotten in contact with a guy who uh, was into funding and loaning money and doing business deals and projects. And as we were having a discussion, he was like, you know, I looked at your entire profile, George. He said I was an underwriter for 20 to 30 years before I got sick and I had to get out of the business. He said, you're 99% of the way there. He said, but you don't know this 1%. And this is the 1% that's killing you. 
And he said, you know, mm. you know how many people I've met in 30 years of underwriting that have a credit score over 800? And I said, no, sir, I don't. You know, I'm expecting a huge number, like 50, 25. He said, you're the fifth. So you got a credit score of 800, and you can't get these funds because you don't know how. And you don't know why. And so once he schooled me on that and what I had to do to get myself in shape financially and presentable, I literally went, I'll never forget it. It was um, July 2019. We had that conversation. August 2019, we started. By September 2019, I had secured my first million-dollar line of credit. You know, and it was just 2020 was supposed to be my breakout year. I finally figured it out. Boom, I was gone, and bang, COVID happened. All my real estate deals I had, I had four deals all gone. Top of the quarter, I had four deals I was working on. Bang, all gone. But it wasn't a complete loss because I feel like the Lord was slowing me down because I was working a lot, Um, you know multiple businesses, multiple projects going on, keeping the train moving, everything happening, that I was moving too fast. Things were moving too fast in my life, and I feel like the Lord locking me down, not me, just the whole world, but me in general because it was more pertinent to me. Me, Him locking me down and being in this house finally got me to focus on these books that I had on the shelf for 17 and 10 years and three years. You see what I'm saying? To get these books done and get them out. So that was the silver lining for me. Completed all four books, and I started publishing them uh, August 2020. And I published a book a month until all four books were out. So, yeah. That's awesome, man. That Thank is you. awesome. You know, like, what what was the main, I mean, you, you talked about the experiences, but was there a main motivation to publish not one, not two, but, you know, multiple books based on different topics? Was it to enlighten other people as to what you knew and passing the knowledge along? Or was it something that, hey, I got to I have to share this information with the world? Yeah, I mean, it was all of it. You know, my my, my book on resistance training for martial artists mm-hmm. um, was first a manual that I started years ago. Mm-hmm. And I would just write notes, things that I've learned because, I, you know, I'm a natural bodybuilder. I've been a natural bodybuilder since mm-hmm. 14 years old. So, you know, I had to incorporate bodybuilding with martial arts. And that book was kind of yeah. like my journey. Like I said, not to be a bodybuilder where you're stiff and you can't move, but you need to have enough muscle fiber, enough strength to be able to strike, to be able to move, to have, you know what I mean? To right. be, mm-hmm. um, to be able to, to act and react when you needed it. And so that really was my journey with that book. But I was so frustrated because I just kept writing stuff down and kept writing stuff down that I had learned and I never mm-hmm. really finished it. So okay. when I got that book to the editor, it was over 70,000 words. They broke that book down to 30,000 words, and that's the book that's out now. But that, I was so frustrated, I put that book on the shelf. I didn't want to touch it. You know, and then my book on property management, like I said, it was eight, ten years. My sister finally was like, you need to write a book, all the stuff you're talking about. And, you know, being defeated from that book, I was like, mm-hmm. I'm not writing no daggone book. I don't know how to write no books. Right. (laughs) So that was that. So those were those two books. Then you have the book on supplements. Now, the book on supplements was to Mm -hmm. was to accompany my martial arts training book, because that was the two questions that I get all the time. Still, how much do you bench and what supplements do you take? So that book was was the exact uh, part B to the workout book and the journey and what I've learned about supplements over the years, because I believe that. Everything you need to heal your body is in nature. That's what God gave it to us for. You know, like, for instance, if you look at aspirin, aspirin is the synthetic derivative of white willow bark. That's white willow bark is what they synthesize and make aspirin out of. Your body doesn't perform on anything you inject in it that's synthetic, only organic and natural, because that's how God created us. You see what I mean? And 
learning those things and understanding those things and implementing those things over the last 30 years um, has changed my life and given me a better quality of life and, and health, you know, um, just in general. So that book was to accompany um, my workout book. And then my fourth book, like I said, I just realized this on um, funding and financing. So how to use your credit rating to put you on the path to debt freedom was the book to accompany my property management book to grow your portfolio. You don't have to worry about money. How do you find the money to grow your portfolio? These are the steps that you need to go, whether you want to have 100 houses, whether you want to have apartment buildings, whether you want to have type A, B, or C type property, commercial properties, whether you want to be a developer, here's the first step to get you there, you know. And so that's how they came about. And how did it happen? It happened out of sheer obedience because, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm saved. And I believe the Lord leads me in certain directions when I'm willing to listen. And so I, um, I lost my last deal. I told you I had four deals in 2020. So my partner called me and said the fourth deal was gone. And I sat on the couch, the same couch I'm talking to you on right now. And I was like, Mm -hmm. Lord, what am I going to do? I don't lost all my deals. This was supposed to be my breakout year. I don't know what's going on. And you got to realize that during COVID, we really thought that, Due to the last administration, they said that this was going to be something 90 days. So I'm like, okay, it's February. We got locked down in March. Hopefully by the summertime, this COVID thing will be done. Boom, it's over, so wrap. We can get back on it. But that information was wrong, you know, from what the government and the previous administration was giving us. But I still sat yeah. down. I was like, Lord, what am I going to do until the summertime? Mm-hmm. And he just whispered, and he said, what about all them books you got? And, you know, I gave him the same response I gave my sister. I'm not writing no daggone books. I tried writing these books, Mm -hmm. and I can't can't get them out of my head, right? So Mm -hmm. we go three, four weeks later. Something else happened. My wife tells me something, and the Lord just whispers again, what about them books? And I said the exact same thing. I'm not writing any books. And when I said it, the Lord has a way of quickening my spirit to stop me to pay attention because the Holy Spirit is in the room. So I stopped and I said, Lord, I don't know anything about writing any books. However, um, you know, need me or guide me. um, So Mm -hmm. as soon as I said that, I picked up my phone and I was watching something on YouTube and a commercial came across and said, do you want to learn how to write your own book and pub self publish and do all this other stuff? And I was like, <laughs> okay, Lord, I hear you. <laughs> okay, I hear you. So, you know, I had my Gideon moment where I was like, eh, all right, if it's meant for me and if this message is from you, this exact same message will be here tomorrow. So that night I was tossing and turning and I wasn't sleeping right because I knew I had challenged the Lord and there's nothing wrong with challenging him, but in my thought, I also didn't want to be pra- chastised for my non-belief because he was giving me kind of a directive, pushing me in the way that I should go. Mm-hmm. So I woke up, got the kids, you know, we're doing virtual learning, so I did all that. One o'clock goes, two o'clock goes, three o'clock goes, and I'm dreading picking up my phone because I remember I issued this challenge the day before. So by 4.30, I pick up my phone, I go on YouTube, and the offer is still there. I noticed you checked on this, that, and the third. If if you're still interested, and I was like, yes, Lord, I am. And I just (laughs) signed right up. (laughs) And after I signed up, you know, they they took away all my apprehensions. They took away all my fears. They helped me to understand what I was doing wrong. They They helped me understand that even the publishing market had changed. You see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, publishing a book, you didn't have to go through a publishing house. You could self-publish through Amazon, and that's exactly what I did. I followed their instructions. I followed right. their 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 course, and within three months, four months, five months, five months almost to the day, I had gotten all my manuscripts done, all my outlines done, because I gave the books to the the, the publishers and the editors two at a time. You see what I mean? to get them done, boom, and they were done. And it's just nobody but God I give the glory to for being obedient to to make that happen. 
No, no doubt about that. Now, are there any other books that you're thinking about you want to write, or are you satisfied with the ones that you've written that you've described to us so far that have these powerful messages that we need to know about, whether it's about um, generational wealth or whether it's about uh, the martial arts? And I'd love to get to, uh, some of your thoughts about that as well, because I did see that you are also uh, involved in that aspect of your life as well. But before we get to that, uh, what about um, the books? Are there any desires to publish any more? And if so, what will they be about? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to make the part two to these books. First of all, my resistance okay. training book, remember I said it was 70,000 words. So those 40,000 words are not going to go away. That's going to be part two to this because all my books are beginners and basics. So now you need to understand now that you have the beginning part of this done, now you need the intermediate and advanced. So that's going to be parts of those books. You know, property management basics is going to turn to property management, uh, you know, intermediate or advanced. You see what I mean? Because just because you understand now how to get a piece of property, now you need to know how to manage the property effectively. Now you need to know how to grow your portfolio effectively now that you've got this piece of property and you have a decent net worth. You see what I mean? And these are things that you're going to have to be able to build on. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, child need milk but at some point in time we need meat as well too <laughs> you know what I mean so my, mm -hmm. my second books are going to be the meat yeah, that makes a lot of sense what do you think are some of the number one errors that people make and I'm sure the book sell, talks about this but just if you can share with our audience that people make when they try to buy real estate or when they try to get real estate what are some of the number one errors that you have found that people find either in the real estate or in the property management category well, the number one area is they buy too high. See, the thing is, when you're dealing with realtors, realtors are like lawyers. They're lazy. They really are. And so realtors only really make money on commission to sell the homes. So when you go to a realtor and say, I'm a real estate investor, this, that, and a third, they throw you, even though they, they take your parameters and say, ask you, what type of house are you looking for? What kind of property do you invest in? They know that. But they take everything that's on the wall that they need to sell and show you. And you're like, you spend a lot of your time. If you're new and you don't know how to evaluate a property in five to ten minutes, you spend a lot of your time walking around houses that you know you're not going to buy. And if you're really hyped up or you got somebody's course where they'll be like, oh, in real estate, you can make $30,000 a month with this flip or do this or do that. It can happen in 45 days. And you believe that hype. <laughs> You buy too high. And then by the time you get into the deal, the reason why a lot of people lose lose their shirts in real estate investing is they bought too high and they sold too low. There was no money in the deal. So by the time you get done, you're just trying to get out of the deal so you don't lose everything. Because um, investing like everything else, you know, when you sign for those loans, even if you're paying, if, if you don't have cash and you get a loan, there's a personal guarantee attached to it. So that means that yes. that company personally can come after you, your house, your private bank accounts, whatever it is, for whatever money they feel is owed to them. So if you're up against the clock and you thought you had $25,000 in the deal and all of a sudden now you don't have 25000 you have 1500 you got to get out of the deal before that 1500 becomes 10000 negative that you owe the lender that he has to recoup for that bad real estate deal that you put him into. You see what I'm saying? So that's the main thing. You've got to learn how to buy low or buy right, should I say, because there are some deals, especially in New Jersey when the housing market was banging, where you could get into a deal and have a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollar equity, two hundred thousand dollar equity in a deal. But those days are gone. You know, the housing market has corrected itself. Most fix and flips, just on the fix and flip side, not the buy and hold. They, you know, some gurus will tell you, oh, yeah, the average is $65,000 in a deal. Yeah, maybe in some states. But where I am, you're lucky if you get twenty to $15,000 when it's all said and done. And then, you know, you have to always understand, too, you have to have the experience and know what your break-even point is when you're in the real estate. You, got, you know what I mean? Like you got to have the crew in place. You got to have everything in place to get in get it done, and get out. Like my investment strategy when I'm fixing and flipping, not buying and holding this, I got to be in the deal and out in 90 days. 
So if I can't buy it, fix it, and flip it in 90 days, I won't touch it. You see what I'm saying? Because that 90 days is my number, but I know I give myself at least two months for oh, crap moments. What does that mean? Oh, crap. We opened up this wall, and we got to do mold remediation. Well, that's two weeks. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. By the time they come spraying to all those chemicals dry and everything, and the inspectors come, that's two to three weeks delay. Can't do anything else till the mold remediation is done. Can't nobody be in the house. Okay? Or, oh, crap, he wanted to buy the house, but the, the closing date fell through. He pushed it back another two weeks. Well, you know, all those weeks, all those days, there's a holding cost that's associated with it. And if you don't plan in advance for that holding cost, you could be stuck. So just imagine now you're in a $400,000, $500,000 property, hypothetically, looking for that two hundred fifty to get out of it in equity. But your holding cost is six to $7,000 a month, $10,000 a month. If you didn't make the proper allocations, you could be stuck because you've lost some liquidity in the deal. See what I mean? You're, you're burning cash faster than you can get it out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know a lot of times people will also be talking about it. I know there was a time frame that flipping houses was very popular. I don't know if it's still popular in the COVID era and everything. So, George, are you seeing a lot of people flipping houses or buying houses and doing renovations? I know some friends of mine have actually been on this show before, Telly uh, Shabu and his wife, Aya. They actually bought a house, and they were doing what you just talked about. They were, But they were doing the fixing because they were planning on moving into the house themselves. They weren't planning on flipping it, but they did find out that it took them a little bit longer than they thought. I mean, in terms of it getting fixed and everything, I think that it's pretty much done now, but it did not go as fast as they thought it was going to go. So what kind of advice do you give to folks when they're thinking about uh, rehabbing a house or either to flip it because they want to sell it to make a profit or um, because they want to move into it themselves? Because one of the things that I recently heard, and it might've been on a friend's podcast or something was that, you know, there's a concern about the homeless population throughout the world and everything, but definitely here in the United States. But this this person that I heard was talking was actually saying that there is enough houses out there for us to actually house everybody if they did some innovative programming and things of that nature. But I was just wondering your thoughts about rehab and, and then if you want to jump on the homeless conversation, you can. Oh, you hit the nail right on the head. As a matter of fact, I'm sourcing a project right now for the homeless. Because you are right. There are, there are houses out there, but they're in areas that people don't think that they're conducive. And I tell people this all the time. It may, may not be conducive to you because where you live, but if you've got somebody sleeping under the bridge, you give them a house, they're going to be happy. They don't care what area it is. It's in. You see what I mean? That's the first thing. Right. Where it's hot running water, you know, they don't have to worry about their stuff getting stolen and it's secure. So, yeah, absolutely. But it, you see, you have to understand that big bank and lenders, um, to answer your question first, the first question, yeah, mm -hmm. there's been a huge uptick in home sales, either buying homes because the mortgage rates are so low or refinancing. So if you refinance your house anything at 3.5% or higher, it's great to refinance because rates are under under 3% right now. So that half percent could make a difference. And so that's what we saw during COVID. When that previous administration, I apologize, y'all, I can't say his name. Um, just no, no problem. Run, me, run, run me the wrong way, you know. But anyway, Dean calls, that being him, said, Dean calls him the orange menace. All right, all right, all right. But, you know, I don't want to espouse my political views on I just can't say his name. Um, but that being yes. said, you know, when the rates were that low, um, everybody was refinancing, you know, because, one, nobody knew how long COVID was going to last. And if the rates were going to be that low and that could stretch that out for 30 years, yeah, if I'm putting 600 to $1,500 in my pocket off of that half percentage, let's say, you know, yeah, I'm going to refinance. But housing really didn't start moving again um, in the areas that I'm investing until like September 2020, um, August 2020, and just really minuscule amounts to see because what had happened also was when the courts had closed, everything had to be virtual, pulling your permits, right. inspections, everything had to be virtual. So counties had to be able to adjust to that. Then you had 
even though building inspectors work for the cities and towns because of COVID, they didn't want to come out and risk being exposed. You see what I mean? So now you would have to go in and take pictures of everything, and they would inspect and certify everything through pictures. You see what I mean? So that process was a huge learning process that took months when it came to the fixing and the flipping. And then the third answer to your question was supply. Almost everybody in any type of supply chain that you're dealing with, even if you're buying stuff on Amazon, they tell you, due to COVID, shipping may be a little bit longer. So if you can't get drywall in a timely manner, wood, if you're doing the stick build or windows or anything else, that also chews into your rehab cost, whether you're rehabbing it or you're rehabbing it to live in it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I know people were surprised by, and I was wondering your thoughts about this in the whole uh, New Jersey area and everything, was I had a number of friends of mine that are actually in the, the uh, real estate business here in North Carolina, where I'm based at, but they were actually having quite a bit of success with the real estate during this time. And a lot of folks were surprised by that. They were surprised that that was a, I guess, for lack of a better term, a recession proof or a pandemic proof industry. But it seems like uh, at least here in North Carolina, and some of this may have been corporate buying in terms of corporate real estate, but there were quite a few real estate agents that seemed like they were doing fairly well and everything. So what was it like in your market? And was that something that you were hearing nationwide that people were doing better in real estate than they expected? Yeah, the numbers were better than expected. But like I said, the numbers were, were better than expected based on two points. Like I had mentioned, the interest rate and also refinancing. Right. You know, I had spoken to right. lenders and they were like, Psh, we're getting so much work, so many, so much refinance work because the rates are so low. And then you have people who are living in apartments and that are waiting for the rates to be low and saying, look, these rates are all time low. We're not going to stay this much again for the next 10 years. Because the last time we saw rates this low was right after the housing market crash in 2007, 2008. You see what I mean? So we're not going to get here again for another 10, 15 years. So, yeah, maybe we should buy because the rates are so low and you know we're in an industry let's say where we're an essential worker so we haven't lost our job so it's it's beneficial to us to do it at this particular time but like everybody else who was pulling back you know a lot of money was pulled out of stock markets a lot of money was pulled out of the investment community and put into private lending or um you know uh, private lending, let's just say private lending in real estate simply because the, the interest rates and the yields were better. You know, when the rates go down, everybody starts to panic because they still need that 10, 15% loan rate, so to speak, you know, so their investors and people that invest in their businesses can get a decent rate of return, you know, and when you're not getting that, it, it, it's just, it's hard. You know, I remember even now, I still get about four to five emails. We got money. We got new lending programs, you know, from no doc to, you know, you name it, portfolio lending programs. Why? Because they have money that, you know, they have money that they have to, exp to expend. You know, they have, they have a, a capital that they have to get rid of and lend so they can meet their obligation to their investors, you know, and that's challenging very challenging so a lot of programs no. and a lot of people i'm sorry but a lot of programs yeah, really agree. quick right a lot of programs that had gone away like 100 percent financing you know are back with certain lenders you know and mm -hmm. and and they're there you just have to be able to find them because the last time we saw 100 percent financing was before the housing market crash where you can get into a property you knew you couldn't pay for because you really didn't pay for anything down you had 100 100 5 percent financing because I I know one of the things that uh, we talked about here on this program as well as some of the other programs that I'm affiliated with is this whole concept of education and what we're not taught and I'm wondering your thoughts on that even in the real estate field because I sometimes feel that just like there was a time that we were taught about um, civics and things of that nature in our school system and definitely taught about physical fitness in our school system that there was a time that we were probably taught a little bit more about um, the basic uh, principles of um, housing and rent and things of that nature, even during the course of a school year. And I don't know that our kids, I don't have any kids, but I do have nephews. I don't know that they are necessarily being 
taught that kind of things at this time and everything. So I was wondering, do you think that this is something that we need to do better of in terms of a society, in terms of learning this stuff, not necessarily when we're in our 20s and 30s or even in some cases 40s and thinking about buying that first house, but even in our school and our college environments? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. My book on credit rating, I talk about three mindsets, poverty mindset, I talk about the blue collar mindset, and I talk about the million dollar mindset. My counterpart, Mm -hmm. you know, are teaching their kids at a young age in investing. Okay. My kids, I talk to them about business, but it goes through one ear and out the other. You see what I mean? Because they're more interested on things that they see that would appeal to them. Nothing wrong with horseback riding for my daughter and my son playing basketball. They're both very good at it. But you have to have something else that you need to understand. What plagues our communities of brown and and black and brown communities is the fact that we don't have a basic understanding of how the economic dollar works. That's why a dollar in our community spends less than a week in our community, whereas counterparts in our Jewish communities, one dollar stays in their community 29, 28 days a month. You see what I mean? And they learn how to spend a dollar. Our wealth we wear on our backs. Our counterparts' wealth they have in bank accounts. They have in investments. They have this. They have that. So when they get up, their parents set them up, and they're set up to be successful. We're set up to work jobs. You see what I mean? And like I tell my wife, I have been a business owner a majority of my adult life, and I've supported this family as such. So. I'm not used to, like, my wife is a worker. I told you she's a grinder. That's what attracted me to her. Mm-hmm. But she was raised that if you needed more money, you either work more hours or you go get a part-time job. And there was a point in our lives where I had to sit her down and ask her, give me a number. Give me a time. We need $20,000. Now, the way that I would do it is I'd go flip a house three months, four months, or I do another business investment where it would take a little bit of time to get that money back, six months. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. She would go work a job. So, okay. However you work, how many hours you make, this, that, and the third, give me a time as to how much time it would take you to make that same $20,000. And whoever's faster, that's what we're going for. But, yeah, now we're not talking about $10,000 or $5,000. Now we're talking about thirty dollars or $40,000. How many hours and how many jobs are you going to work to make that? And if you can't come up with the right number, then we have to go this way because this is the fastest way I know how to earn this. See, the thing is, when you work for yourself, you have to generate clients either through investments, whatever your job is, whatever your business is. But when you work for hours, all you got to do is just go ask for more hours. Overtime, if you're part-time, going full-time, whatever it is. You see what I mean? So getting hours is easier. Generating income is different, difficult. Why? Because you got to go prospect for new clients. You got to spend money to get clients. There's a lot of other things that you have to do. You have to spend money to make money in investments. It's, It's challenging. And so you have to be able to understand that as a whole. And so because we don't understand that as a whole, um, due to just us in this country in general, you know, that's how we were taught because um, you guys know the history as well. Every time that we tried to make an economic stand in this country for our communities, whether it was Black Wall Street or the National Bank of Harlem, it was destroyed. Why? Because they couldn't allow us to, to, to get our foothold into the financial systems that are the lifeblood of this country, of this global economy. You know, think about it. How can we be, how can we be, we spend billions of dollars a year, but we spend billions of dollars a year as a community on stuff. Our counterparts spend billions right. of dollars a year on assets. Yeah, you that's see, very true. They do spend all that. Yeah. I was just thinking about what you're saying, and definitely, you're right. They do spend it on assets on a regular basis. The other thing that I sometimes wonder, and this is just a general comment, but definitely one that I think that you'll be able to speak to, and it's not just within our community, but various communities, is a lot of times we get caught up in 
the time management trap, meaning that a lot of times we're trying to do multiple jobs and trying to manage them all effectively. And of course, there's only 24 hours in a day. I know that that's one of the arguments I have when folks will sometimes approach me about getting involved in those uh, quick fix kind of uh, programs, whether that's Amway or mm -hmm. whether that's um, some of the other programs like that. Because I know that I'm already working a uh, couple of uh, regular jobs and everything, and then I've got my own enterprise that I'm involved with, which is kind of this media enterprise that uh, Dean is part of, as well as my folks at IBM TV and everything. So that's three uh, folks that I'm already dealing with, and that's plenty. So when folks try to say, well, you know, we could use your expertise and your skill sets and your people knowledge to help our business, I'm going like, but there's only one of me, and you're talking about me adding a fourth or a fifth enterprise. Now, I do know right, some right. great entrepreneurs have as many as five or six businesses, but a lot of times those other businesses are also having other people run aspects of that business. So while a that person whose name we, were, we won't mention might have various businesses or Oprah might have various businesses, they're not, or even Michael Jordan, they're not all being run by uh, Michael and them. They've got different people in charge of different aspects of those different businesses. So that's the difference between say me and somebody that's got those kind of resources. So I was just wondering, what, how do you manage doing the whole time management aspect of what you do? Well, I got a calendar on my phone and I allot my time, I allot my time based on what it is I need to get done hours in the day. Because you're right, we spend a lot of time in nothing work, not getting anything done. You know, if you work right. for a job, it's called water, water cooler talk, where you're getting paid, but you're not doing anything or being productive. But when you work, yeah. for, your, when you work for yourself, you, it's mandatory that you complete the task that you need in order to be successful. Success is being right. able to survive in that business. So I don't have that much time, you know. When, when you talk about Oprah and Michael Jordan and a lot of other successful people, well, that's the millionaire mindset. Why? A lot of people don't understand that a millionaire at any given time in his life has seven to ten business entities that he's involved in. Doesn't manage all of them, but he's involved right. in. So if one goes down, he's not struggling for cash because he has you know, six to nine that he still can depend on. You see what I mean? And they also understand how money and investment works. So when you are when you are moving and you're starting a business and you go to somebody for an investment, you have to understand what you're willing to give up to get that investment from them to grow your business. That's why I think there needs to be a strong educational presence of entrepreneurs and having them understand what first it is to be an entrepreneur, second, what it is to give up, what you're giving up to be that entrepreneur. It's not just time. It's not just money. It's your dream. It's your energy. It's that creativity. What a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners don't understand is once you get angel investors and equity investors involved, by the time that whole thing is said and done, you're probably going to own less than 10% of your business. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now, the question is, Depending on where you been, built that business and where that vision is, is that 10% worth it to you? So, for instance, mm -hmm. you're starting a business. You go with your first round. Everybody knows the first round is self, family, and friends. You raise that $10,000, right. you get your business to $100,000, $200,000 a year business, but you're stuck. You need capital now to grow that hundred to two hundred thousand dollar a year business to one million to two million dollars a year. So now you have an investor come in and say, okay, I looked at your business plan, I've seen this, I know you guys are making this. You need half a million dollars to get your business now to million to two million dollars a year business. I'll do that. But I want thirty to forty percent of the business for that half a million dollars. Then you go, huh, 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 is it worth it? Maybe you can negotiate them down. I'll give them 30%. Take this half a million. He invested in the business. Now your business is at a million to $2 million. Let's say $2 million because that number sounds better. You guys are trucking yeah. along, making $2 million a year, right, on the investment business is moving. Now you want to increase the business valuation and get the business to $100 million a year, or that might be much. 
let's say, $10 million a year, moving $15 million a year. You need more money. So now you've got another investor. Now, this is your third round of financing now. Now, another investor is going to come in and say, okay, you need $750,000 of infrastructure investment, whatever it is, to get you to that $10 million a year. Boom, we got that for you. But for that, we want 40%. Now, what happens? Your first investor doesn't say, yeah, George, we're in this together. No, you're the one that has to give up your equity because that investor is not right. giving up his 30%. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So now yeah. what happens? Boom, you give up that 40%. You gave away 40% of your company, and now you're a $10 million a year company. So let's say now the company's booming. It's moving. I want to move it to $100 million. How do you do it? You see you only got 30% left. So right. now you give up that 10%. Everybody's happy. $100 million company. Why am I saying that? Because when you started, you spent $10,000. In 10 years, you built a $100 million company, right? That 10% of $100 million is your percentage worth uh, uh, $10 million. Is it worth it to you? Some people say yes. Some people say no. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so you have to know no, how to get exactly into the company, and you have to know how to get out yeah, of the company. exactly what you're saying. Yep. And right. I've actually run across some folks that had that conversation, they actually had that conversation with a business that they're putting together and everything. But the conversation, as I recall it being told, was actually the offer was a little bit too much for them and everything. And I'm thinking that you would probably agree with them because they were putting together a um, a business and everything that could possibly be eventually worth hundred million or maybe even more than that and everything, mm-hmm. but they were hit by a foreign investor and the foreign investor basically wanted them to give up not just a percentage, but also to give up control. And I think that they felt that that was a little bit too much for that first initial wave. I think now if somebody come to them and said like, you know, like you just described 30% and then somebody came with 40% later and then eventually they did wind up losing control then they'd probably been all right with that. But as it was, this was a, startup business and when it started up they just felt that that person was coming at them basically wanted to buy the entire company probably because they saw the worth of the company but at the same time they would have no uh say so in the company and like you said they may they may eventually have no say so anyway because they've got these different investors but they felt that that was too fast of a move too soon i'll put it that way Yeah, I mean, you know, it all depends on the business. And if your gut tells you that's what it is and that's what it is, because what a lot of companies will do is a lot of companies will buy a business or business that's struggling instead of building a new business unit that they need. That's why you hear a lot of these companies like tech companies like Twitter and all these other companies buying these uh, smaller companies because it's cheaper than having to build it from scratch. And because we have a working model and proof of concept, let's just pay for this and absorb it as the tools are trying to build the exact same thing and maybe compete with them or do it wrong. You know what I mean? We don't have time to build it. If it took them 10 years to get to where they are today, we don't have 10 years. We need to absorb this now so we can push this entire machine 10 years down the future as opposed to 10 years of research and development, spending all that money and still get it wrong. So it's just really a thought process of what you're, what you're willing to uh, live with. You know, I mean, just hearing that scenario, if they want to complete control, then you write the check. It has to be a great check. Goodbye. See you later with no sunset clause and no non-compete. Why? Right. Why do I say that? Simple for two reasons. When you're the creative, you know the beginning, the middle, and the end of your vision. That's what makes right. you special. Where a lot of businesses fail is they want to come in and take creative control like they know where your mind is. No. I know how to start this business, run this business, and maximize this business in my mind all the way from the top. You see the potential, but you're going to put your thought process in there, good, bad, or indifferent. And a lot of time, your thought process is going to um, 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 collide with my thought process, and it's not going to work. And so, therefore, it fails. And when it fails, what do they do? They come right back to the creator of it and say, oh, well, we ran into this issue, that issue. That's why a lot of businesses, what they'll do is once they buy that last percentage to get that company where they're going, 
they keep you on as a CEO. They keep you on in a certain capacity yeah. to keep your dream and your vision going. You see what I mean? To make that money as opposed to just uh, I'm getting you out of the picture, so to speak. But, you know, every business is different. If it was me personally, I'd have took the money and said good luck. But you can't stop me from doing this exact same thing <laughs> here, right? you know what I mean, and making it work. Simple. Right. Because they probably would not have had the skill set to make it work, and you could just do it under a different name or something else That's if you had the money to do it. Differently, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. They would have, like they would have funded a brand different. new business for me. Absolutely, they would have funded a brand new business for me. I wouldn't have had any headache. I would have just changed the name on the door, man, and kept it going. <laughs> just kept it moving and everything. One of the things that I know you advertise yourself as is both a consultant and a coach, and I know we've talked about this on this show as well as a couple of other platforms, but how important do you think it is for entrepreneurs and business people, particularly in our community, to have a coach? And so how vital do you think it is to have a coach, particularly in the business aspect? And then, like I said, I do want to get into a little bit of your sports and fitness stuff as well, but definitely how important do you think it is to have a coach? Oh, yeah, it's, it's night and day. It's live or die. You know, as a coach and a martial arts instructor, um, you know, I'm the man. I'm the one that everybody looks to to get the proper instruction for the techniques that I'm trying to teach you in the application. Well, it's the same thing. You know, having a coach or having a mentor in business is life or death. It's life or death. Because just imagine that you could open up the Rolodex of Mark Cuban and have access mm. to his Rolodex. Okay, just imagine if you had access to Oprah's Rolodex. You see what I mean? And all you had to do was just shut up and listen. They tell you how to do everything. They consult you how to do everything. They pick up the phone and say, hey, my person is going to call you about this particular deal. Boom, boom, boom. I'm sending them. Okay? That's really how a lot of deals get done. I mean, think about it. Why do you think they started the ABC show Shark Tank, per se? Because you had billionaires right. that needed to invest money. And one thing about anything in this world, you need a creative idea. If it's television, if it's YouTube, if it's whoever, they need content. So they're going to open the mm-hmm. gates to people to put content on their platform for free. Well, the same thing with businesses. Businesses need new ideals. So they're going to walk people through the door instead of them going to look for new people. To you know, they're going to walk people through the door to bring these ideals that need to can go to market and be successful, keeping growth and things of that nature. So yeah, absolutely, it's imperative. I don't know how many thousands of dollars I saved because I had coaches and mentors when I started with real estate. First thing I did was work at a, a investment company down the street here in Neptune. And I drive to his office every day. Why? Because he had been flip, fixing and flipping houses longer than I had. He taught me some stuff that probably saved me tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. Why? Because I didn't know it. So I was willing to take that role, getting back into the fix and flip industry, besides just buying and holding. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's instrumental, instrumental. Now, I'm not saying that it's for everybody, because a lot of times people think, oh, I can do it myself. But... My grandmother always had a saying, life will show you better than I can tell you. And I always keep that to heart. Always keep that to heart. And at 47 years old, I'm done taking lumps. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't recover like I used to if I lose twenty or $30,000. I'm not that young anymore. I'm on the hustle, on the grind. So it's almost like every dollar that I have now has to be maximized, so to speak. You know, I'm not that hard-headed anymore. So if you tell me to jump, I'll jump. You tell me to slide, I'll slide. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you just mentioned the mentor and the importance of mentors and all of that. But also, who were some of the people that were your inspirations coming up and everything, even within your own business journey and your own entrepreneurial journey? You've mentioned a couple of the folks that I'm imagining were those on a historical level or on a worldwide level like Oprah and like Michael Jordan and a number of others, but just in terms of your own aspect, whether it was a family member or whether it was somebody that you saw growing up that was like a great 
small time store owner, but definitely had that entrepreneurial spirit. Who are some of those folks that influenced you in this entrepreneurial journey of yours? Well, honestly, you know, my dad put me on his shoulders when I was 11 years old. I mean, seven years old. And um, he told me, he said, you're never going to amount to anything working for somebody because all basically you're going to have is a job. And that stuck with me at seven years old because he, when I was on his shoulders, he was showing me all the land that we own. And he said, from that mountain to that over there, that's all our property. And we used to have a, a ranch chicken farm. We raised chicken, pigs. You know, we had a poultry mm-hmm. business. We sold chicken eggs, things of that nature, um, overseas in Liberia, West Africa. And we supplied the entire southeastern region with chicken and chicken eggs and, and poultry poultry and um, um, pigs. We never got into cattle ranching because the Civil War happened. But that's what we did. You know, my mother being from here and being American, um, my grandmother was an influence because my grandmother kept it all together. She was the matriarch for over 67, 60 years, almost 70 years before she passed. She not only raised her kids, she raised her grandkids, us, you know. So these were the people that influenced me, and these were the people that pushed me. These were the people that always told me what they expect of me. You know, never beat me down, never told me I was never going to be anything. No, this is what we expect of you. So I always had that support, and I was always a go-getter. I knew from my temperament, even working a simple job because, you know, being in high school, yeah, I've worked at pizza shops and, you know, retail. I knew that my life wasn't going to be working for somebody because you didn't have anything. You didn't have anything at all. I remember working a summer job, and I know I'm going to be telling on myself when I tell you the minimum wage, where the minimum wage was $3.25 an hour. Factory job. Factory job. And I worked it one summer in college, and I didn't even last the whole summer. I think I lasted five weeks because literally, you know, when you're working in the factory, you're dealing in the heat, you're dealing with all the stuff that goes along with it. And after 40 hours a week, you come home with $115.49. That's it. And I'm like, oh, no, this is not going to (laughs) work. This is not going to work for me. You know, so, yeah, man, those are my influences. I always knew, and I was always a go-getter. I mean, when I had my digital publishing company before it went under years ago, you know, I would just go, just go. I went to South Africa just on a business trip. I went to um, um, I went to uh, Japan on another business trip, and people were just like, for such a young guy, I mean, in my late 20s, 29, 28, you know, you're just here. We were talking to you on the phone, and now you're here to talk about this, you know, cell phone deal that we're putting in place. Or we were talking about this, and now you're in Japan talking about this particular, you know, digital media deal. And they're like, we, we don't see people like that. And I said, why? They said, because we get hundreds of calls of people talking about doing business with us from around the world, and then they don't show up. He said, we spoke to you two or three weeks ago, and you're here today talking about this deal. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not here to waste any time. Let's go. Let's get it. Now, that was young ambition, but because I didn't know how the structures would work, I would go with the business ideal, but I wouldn't go with all the other foundational stuff. So what would happen? People would look at my business plan, look at my ideals, give me the little yes and the nod, and then, oh, no, we're not interested, only to find out 12 months, 15 months later, my exact same business plan that they had, they implemented. (laughs) You see what I mean? So I didn't have all that knowledge that I needed to protect those ideals and business in a way that people had most respect for me to do it, like non-disclosure agreements or international non-disclosure agreements come with partners that understood how business worked in Japan to be able to negotiate a successful deal and get profit from it. You see what I mean? get letters of intent when you're trying to build, uh, you know, uh, a cell phone company when cell phones were just going into Africa. You see what I mean? Those type of things. Letters of intent, bigger companies standing behind you to be able to support your effort, you know, letters of intent for uh, bank guarantees for monies that would be spent in order to develop these cell phone towers and bring that infrastructure. Just all those little things, man. 
all those little things. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I know you said that part of your family is from Liberia and everything. And I know that one of the things we've talked about on this show, we've had a couple of guests that have mentioned it, is the need for us as a people to be more global in our nature. Like you talked about some of the other societies, they're already doing that. So both in the real estate as well as just in business in general, how important do you think it is for us to reach out to our brothers and sisters from, say, Liberia or Ghana, where I know they were offering opportunities for people to come back to Ghana to even start up businesses and things of that nature or South Africa or even other parts of the diaspora, maybe like Jamaica and um, um, some of the other islands that are out there, Cuba, as well as a number of other ones. But how important do you think it is for us to become more global, but particularly more global with other aspects of our own diaspora? Oh, it's crucial. It's crucial. When I say mission critical, there's nothing more mission critical than it now. Why? Because when you go back to West Africa or South Africa, East Africa or North Africa, you'll get the truth from us. Okay? We were not just sent here to be ignorant, dumb niggas. Excuse my excuse my that phrase, but that's the phrase that they right. put on us. And that's the phrase that we adapted amongst ourselves. When you go back home and you see that we're smart, when you go back home and you see that we're engineers and we're developing things that they will never let you know that we have the capability of doing, okay? Uh anything from we have doctors that you know, are developing vaccine drugs. Now, it may not be on the scale in the Western countries, but we're doing it back home, okay? A lot of people don't know that Ghana was the first West African country to develop a car, okay? But you'll never know that. Why? Because we're used to buying cars from Germany. We're used to buying cars from the United States. We're used to buying cars Mm -hmm. from Japan. We're not used to buying cars from Ghana. So there's no real... Uh, investment infrastructure going in there and saying, wait, hold on. And these are good cars. You see what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? So why don't we invest in the car industry there? The resources are completely untapped. But I'm saying that to say that that's actually not true because China understands that. So now the biggest provider on the continent of funds is China. Why? Why? because their economy is growing, doubling, and tripling, and they need those resources to take to China. You see what I'm saying? And so Mm -hmm. we don't get the development. We don't get the infrastructure in place for us, right? And what's going to happen on the continent? Next thing you know, everything is going to be private property. Your your ancestral land is going to belong to somebody else because – we didn't have the economic advantage. Look at all that oil that they found in the Congo. And the Congolese government mm. was basically forced to sell it to France. So you mean to tell me the Congolese people are so stupid, they don't know how to drill oil for themselves to make their company as viable and as solvent as the Middle East and the Saudis do? No. The French just basically came and took it for virtually nothing. They didn't even cut them a deal on the gas and the oil that they were pumping out of their own country. Think about that. Well, because if anybody was smart, you'd have been like, oh, no. From now on, we paying 25 cents a liter for gas. Now, nah. they right up there with everybody else for their own resources. See what I'm saying? So it's, it's mission critical that people understand that. And you're not, you, we are not what they told us we are. We are who, are we, who we are supposed to be. And all of that is back home in Africa for us. The problem in Africa is we don't have the resources, financial resources to build. Why do you think certain companies will go there and think they're doing us a favor by giving us micro loans to sell things in markets and do this and do that? No, it's just a pacifier. They're just giving us a little thumb in our mouth so we can just be thankful that we can live day to day. What about the money that we need to build factories? Uh, you know, in the, if the Industrial Revolution uh, uh, supported this country in the 1990s. Think about what the industrial revolution can do, and the technological, excuse me, revolution can do in a country like Africa, where the land is plenty, the resources is plenty. You see what I mean? Think about that. It's there, but every time you know we get to those points, the old the old lines of colonialism um, um, take mm-hmm. hold. 
you know, whether it's Dutch, whether it's French, whether it's British, whether it's U.S., you name it. And so they, they're beholding to their old colonial masters. Well, you know, we only really do business with French companies or Dutch companies or German companies or, you know what I mean, or British companies. You really don't know about this. And so even in Africa, sometimes the people of color, we got to jump through who do something to benefit them, you know. Mm. And that's that's the biggest that's the biggest uh, hurdle that sometimes you have to go through, but it's worth it. And the reason why it's worth it because once it's there, it's going to last forever. It's for you. You don't have to sit in a place and wonder, uh, you know, if somebody's going to come kill you just because of the color of your skin. You can go back home and be celebrated, and you see your ancestors. You know, uh, a lot of people are doing these DNA tests where they're finding out where their ancestral genes are coming from, and they're going back to those places and seeing their people. Right. You know what I mean? And getting that final piece of who I am that final thing that was taken from us when we came here in this country in the slave ships, as far as who we are as a people and why we matter. So now when they say African-American, we can say, yes, African-American from Liberia and the, the Kron region, the Southeastern region of, of Liberia, those are my people. Just like the Asians do and the Italian Americans come in and say, Oh, my father's from Sicily. You know, we have a sense of self-worth. And now they can't take that from us anymore. We know who we are. Yeah, we definitely need to have more of that because a lot of times we don't know where we're from. And a lot of times there's also various mixtures within everybody because a lot of us are very much uh, the typical uh, definition of what would be considered a mulatto back in the day, meaning that you've got ancestry from a variety of cultures and all of that. So I think that there's plenty of that that goes on in the, the world as well, but you need to be proud of all of the aspects of your culture. Because I know that I have proud uh, aspects of the European American parts that I have, but also definitely the predominant African American and Native American parts as well. So definitely I think you need to have pride in all of the cultures that are part of whoever you are as an entity. Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. But I look at it the way they see it. You see what I mean? Right. Because now we've we shift to a culture where they don't see your uniqueness. They only see what you are. Like when President Obama was, even though President Obama's mother was white, he was still a black man. And he was treated like right. a black man in the White House and everything that he did. They didn't have any respect for the white side of it. And, you know, with this last administration that was there, that's exactly what they brought out. They brought out, it's okay to say what you want to say to somebody's face and do what you want to do and this, that, and the third. He, he championed it. He welcomed them. And so now they're out. You know, they don't have to keep their hoods on. They come to you right to your face and tell you how they feel. So you can't celebrate those particular sides. They only see you as a black man. You see what I mean? Right. And that's, that's, all you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll all, that's all you'll be to them, you know. And I don't have any problem with that because for the first time in my life, in my life, I see you coming. I don't got to worry about you being in my back. I see you, you know, and it's a good thing that I'm a lifelong martial artist because you reach, I reach. Only thing is when I reach for you, you won't be coming back. No, that makes a lot of sense. I definitely want to come to the martial arts aspect in the last uh 20 minutes or so and everything, but how important do you think it is for business leaders? We saw it some with our sports leaders, but how important do you think it is for our business leaders to get involved in the, the Black Lives Matter movement and to use their business uh, acumen and their business skills in order to help the fight against this racism that is still very much existent that is part of what you're talking about, George? So how important do you think it is for our leaders in our business community to get involved in this uh struggle, whether it's called Black Lives Matter or whatever title you want to give it, but it's definitely about trying to make sure that we are seen as our true authentic selves and that we are not belittled and uh, not uh, take, having our history and our culture stripped from us as so often it is. Oh, man, it's another thing that's mission critical as far as I'm concerned. You know, my counterparts don't have to have the conversation with their uh, black son about what it is to be a black son. In United States, whether you're driving black, while black, whether you're walking on the sidewalk, he's in middle school. But I still got to tell him what it is he has to do in order to be able to survive and come home to me and his mother. 
you know. And it's still sobering, even though I went through it as a child and being called a nigga as a child. Pardon, pardon me. I don't like to say that word, but that's the exact word that I was called. I know a lot of people say the N-word, but the N-word doesn't mean anything to me because the N-word can be nice as far as I'm concerned. You see what I mean? The exact word that they right. used to demean me or let me know that I wasn't worth the spit on the bottom of their shoe, that's the word. So I apologize for using that word, but that's the word that I was called. You see what I'm saying? So um, right. they don't have any recollection of that. They don't have any, you know, when you talk about white privilege, it's a real thing. So everything basically was made up until this cell phone and capturing it on video and seeing it happen in real time became the truth. And when you sit and have people that for years were saying, oh, it can't be that bad. They can't be going through that all the time. And then when they see it, what happens? Some of them, their heart change. Some of them stand with you. Mm -hmm. Some of them fight with you, right? Because they don't believe that that's the type of society that they want to live in or raise their kids in. But we have to, as a people, have to be able to stand up the way they stand up and are willing to stand up for what they believe in and who they are. You see what I'm saying? And we can't be afraid of it. The reason why we can't be afraid of it is because there's people standing behind us, like our kids. You see what I mean? It was different. There's, there's no more fire hoses now. They've even given us the ability to buy guns and buy them the way they do. So you got guns, we got guns. How y'all want to talk? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, there has to come to a consensus where we can have a civilized conversation. But if not, we can go for that rah-rah stuff, too. Wouldn't want to. We're dying 10 to 1. Think about it. How many black men have died since George Floyd got strangled and killed? Did it wow. stop? No. It's a daily, mm -hmm. it's a yearly occasion to the point now mass media even stopped talking about it because they're still killing us. The same things that they champion us for as far as sports and keeping us in our place and being a good athlete or being a good yes man is the same thing that makes us dangerous to people. What do you think? My son is in middle school. My son was in elementary school when this happened. I apologize, right? My son is the most yeah. loving kid, not because he's my son. If he wasn't, I wouldn't say it. Loving kid, always willing to make a friend, happy-go-lucky. Turns when he started getting in trouble because they saw his transcript and was like, oh, well, um, you know, this is just a kid from Newark. Newark kid, their perception of him. Oh, he's aggressive. Mm -mm, don't put me aggressive. My son doesn't have an aggressive bone on his body. I'm big, so my son is big. Oh, he's intimidating. How can a five-year-old be intimidating? Explain that to me. <laughs> you, see, you see what I'm saying? Explain that one to me. Yeah, he's tall. I'm big. I'm tall. I come from a tall family. But intimidate? Really? Come on. I'm not going to let you all put my son in that box or put that on him to make him feel that way. When a lot of the times it was his counterparts in class that were doing certain things, but getting him in trouble. And then when he responds, but, all of a sudden he's this or he's that. Okay. That's what we have to go through when we walk in this country in our skin. People just don't believe it. So you have to always stay vigilant. You know, I told my wife the other day, no. There was a big thing about Antifa and Antifa this and Antifa that. And right. my hand to God, I had been so busy, I didn't know what Antifa was. Uh, I honestly didn't. had no idea about it because I try to limit my social media and all this other stuff because I just don't have time to get sucked into that. Right? So I figured, oh, well, you know, um, Antifa has to be something Afrocentric because that's how it sounds. As I'm digging into this whole thing at Antifa and going online and finding out what it is and the statement of it technically being anti-fascist, the reason why I was going through it was after the last presidential debate where he had where he told him to stand stand up and stand back. And I was like, who's, right. who's he talking about? Right. So I got sucked into that whole thing. <laughs> right. Finding out who they were, what they were doing. I finally asked her. 
I said, as bold as and brazen, proud boys and everybody else are coming together. Don't you kind of think that you want groups like Antifa and the new Black Panthers out here to let them know that, hey, we're not going for that stuff that our parents went for? I mean, let's just be honest. You know, we're not going to be marching peacefully and, and you just kill us indiscriminately because you can. Not anymore. You see what I'm saying? So um, mm-hmm. I'm saying that to say in a long-winded way, yes, you know, support those movements because it could be you tomorrow, you know, it could be somebody else tomorrow. And we need those people out there to make sure that we always have a voice and make sure that we're represented. You know, we're not going to just die down anymore or just let it go away like we've done in the past. No, and, and even to tie it into your other passion, which is fitness, I sometimes think that we oftentimes let ourselves get categorized too quickly in the fitness area and everything along those lines. I know, know that there are some young folks, even in my own life, folks that are, well, actually one of the gentlemen is now a grown man. He's probably in his 20s or 30s, but at the time he was a teenager, they were diagnosing him with being like a uh, um not super hyper, but having one of those kind of like ailments that they felt that he needed to be on Ritalin and things of that nature. So I think uh-huh. that sometimes ADD, we are too ADD, quick to diagnose yeah. those. Yeah, that's it. Right, exactly. That was it. Yeah. But well, I sometimes what? think I that we don't pay it. enough to... I still have Go ahead, it. Okay. Um, I still have it. I, I'm, I, I, uh, I wasn't diagnosed, but I was very hyperactive. So, you know, here's the thing. Me still being, quote, unquote, like I'm self-diagnosing myself, diagnosing myself, so I probably have adult ADHD, but the reason why it works now for me is because it's finally given me the ability to multitask. I can do three or four things at a time and get them done. You see what I mean? As opposed to being stuck in one dormant situation. So it's never really a negative. It's always a positive. But, yeah, you can't allow them to you know, uh, fill your child with Ritalin and all these other things to calm them down and do all these other things. No, that's all right. You have to learn how to teach a child. Same thing I do. When I'm teaching martial arts and I know a kid has ADHD or ADD or whatever it is, I keep him engaged in the martial arts program that I'm teaching him. You see what I mean? To get him going and keeping his mind moving, you have to teach them differently. You can't put all the kids in the same box in order to make that work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How important do you think it is for us to learn things like martial arts and just uh, physical fitness? Because I do think that sometimes in our society, we don't do enough with our physical fitness, and I'm even guilty of that myself. I know that a good friend of mine was just down at our uh, local gym here, meaning the apartment complex gym, and he was like saying, hey, Mark, you need to get down there. They've got all kinds of new equipment, and definitely I need to do better, even if it's nothing but going on more walks as I've been doing a lot of brain exercises, but not doing enough physical exercise. But how do you, important do you think it is for us to um, be aware of our physical fitness and our nutrition? Because I did see that you were a sports nutritionist as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's your life's blood. It's your life's blood. You know, in our community, the big thing that kill us are hypertension and diabetes. And so hypertension, because we're not exercising, we're not releasing all of those stress hormones that we bring home every day, you know, and it's even stressful for us. It's compounded for us. You see what I'm saying? We have to fight for everything, the job that we got. We, we have to be 100% while our counterpart can be 50% and they can still get the job over us just by the way that we look, just by the way we talk just by the way we speak, okay? So we have to deal with all those stresses and those strains. And so we get taken out, heart failure, kidney failure. You know, in our communities, we were never really taught how to eat properly. So a lot of the foods that we eat, they're good to eat at certain times, like holidays, but you can't eat that kind of fat and process this and, you know, sugars in your body every day, all day, the way that we eat in our communities. So if you want a better quality of life, yeah, it's crucially important, crucially important that you exercise. I mean, I went when I was young and bodybuilding, I used to be in the gym five days a week, working out two hours a day. 
I didn't know then that I was overtraining. But at 14, 15 years old, I was young. I could recuperate, boom, fast. Didn't mean anything. I can't work out like that now. My workouts now, which I've mastered, are only 15 to 30 minutes. That includes stretch and workout. Why? Because my intensity level is up for 15 to 30 minutes. So I'm getting all the work that I want to get done done in that amount of time, but um, in that 30-minute gap, but I'm not overtraining. I'm fit. I carry a certain structure. I don't have to worry about my vitals being off and all these other things that um, happen in our community just simply because we don't know, we're too lazy, care until it becomes mission critical. And it's just not our community. Most of everybody only takes t- takes care of their health, excuse me, when the doctor says it. Oh, your vitals are so high, you're getting ready to have the stroke. You got to cut out salt, sugar, this, that, and the third. That's only when we pay attention. You see what I'm saying? Or this has happened. And if you don't lose this much weight, this is going to happen with diabetes or that and the third. That's the only time we pay attention. But other than that, our day-to-day life, we don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. And exercising is crucial. It's absolutely crucial, just like martial arts. The reason why I'm a lifelong martial artist is because there's no other sport that you can play. I mean, you, well, you can play for such a long time. I'll always learn how to kick and punch, no matter how old I get, because the technique of kicking and punching is not that strenuous unless you're hitting a bag or something. That extending your hand, rolling your fist, that moving, keeping that rhythm, you know. You, when you're young, you can kick somebody in the face, and that all looks good. But when you get older, you realize that kicking somebody in the knee is more effective. So as I'm older, I don't have to kick anybody in the face anymore. I have to throw a good leg kick. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And I have to be able to throw a good mm-hmm. stiff jab or a good two-piece combination to defend myself if that's what needs to happen. So your mind changes, and that's something that you can do every day. That's something that you can continue to do no matter how old you are because deterioration is a real thing. Atrophy is a real thing. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So if you're not doing something every day, it becomes harder to do it, harder to get there, and you're going to be more prone to injury when you do it. Simple. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It definitely makes a whole lot of sense. And I know a lot of times you were talking about the doctor. We don't even like to pay attention to the doctor. So you add to the fact that a lot of times we have a fear of doctors. That's why a lot of folks, I'm not saying all, but there are quite a few folks that have been even um, kind of apprehensive about going to get the vaccine because of their own fear of doctors. And I think that that's something that's very prevalent in our society, meaning the African-American and the, uh, or you just said earlier, the black and brown community, this fear of uh medicine and fear of doctors in general. So that probably doesn't help if you're not doing exercise and you've also got a fear of the doctor as well. Yeah, but I I get it. I understand. I understand Tuskegee. I understand everything else. But here's the thing. I got COVID and I couldn't even tell you talking to you on the phone how I got COVID. Okay. I was the most careful person. I washed my hands. I have anti-wipes, bacterial wipes, you name it, wipes in the car, everywhere, wearing a mask, wouldn't go anywhere without wearing a mask, and I still caught it, okay? And I didn't even know I had it. I actually thought I had an upper respiratory infection when I started getting shortness of breath. None of this stuff ever happened to me to the point I couldn't even walk to the bathroom without having issues or problems. That's how severe the shortness of breath was. So when the doctor told me, oh, I had COVID, I couldn't believe it. I literally sat in the chair and I was fighting back the tears because I was like, Lord, how could this happen to me? I was so this. I was so that. But it happened. And then I was relieved because like, okay, now that I know that I have it, these are some of the steps that I need to take to make sure that it doesn't get worse, Um, you know, I can get on the path to getting better. And so my doctor prescribed um, some steroids to help me breathe and open up my lungs. And within 24 hours, it was night and day difference. My body went from 24% to 75%, 24 hours. So once I could breathe, I can get myself back to being together. Why am I saying that about this particular vaccine? 
Because you have to understand, in my eye, one, the reason why I'm getting vaccinated is because they're not making the vaccine for me. They're making the vaccine for them. There are white right. people in line <laughs> demanding to get the vaccine. So you really think that they would make a vaccine that would kill their entire population? Nah. They're making that vaccine to survive. So that's the only real saving grace when this vaccine, when it comes to me. So as soon as I'm eligible, I'm getting it because I'm not going through what I went through before, not knowing what was happening to me, only to find out I'm, I got COVID-19. And that's it. That's my opinion on it. Now, if they were saying the vaccine was for primarily a black and black and brown people, then yeah, I'm out. But if it's for them and they're demanding it, oh, I'm with y'all. Now that makes a lot of sense. I definitely can understand that belief system and that attitude. I'm with you on that. I'm not quite at the age or the uh, job field, even though I did find out that education is included. And even though I'm not technically a teacher, I do work with a testing company. So I technically may fall under it under the education aspect. I got to look that up and see if that's the case or not. Right. It seems like it was a broad definition of education. So if they, they meant education is only teachers or if they meant anybody in the education field, then that pretty much includes me as well. Since testing is a form of education, even though we're not dealing with people on a, uh, like not dealing with the students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So that's what I got to figure out is what they meant by that definition. But um, as far right. as the martial arts, when did you first get involved in it in terms of your interest? Were you like one of those kids growing up that was all into uh, Bruce Lee and some of the other icons of Japanese and Asian culture? Or were you just kind of like something that you developed maybe when you were uh, working in a job or maybe even the military or something like that? But when did the whole love of the martial arts come to you? That's a great question. Um, I grew up as an elementary. My father's from Liberia, so I grew up for a time in Liberia, and I was very skinny, and I used to get picked on. And the first movie that I saw was Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. And then the first magazine that I saw was, uh, I don't I want to say Pumping Iron, but the first person that I saw was Arnold Schwarzenegger. I can't remember the name of the, of the uh, magazine that I saw him in it and combination of those two people. And I remember taking my dad's encyclopedias off of his shelf and putting them in my book bags and taking the broomstick and making a dumbbell. And that's what I used because he refused to buy me weights. And I remember forcing myself to do push-ups. It was my dad that put me in a martial arts class when I was nine. But the problem was um, Master Lee didn't know how to teach kids. Master Lee was brought from South Korea to teach the Liberian Secret Service self-defense and defensive tactics techniques because they protected the president. So he also had a class uh, on Wednesday night where he taught, you know, other people and adults as well, too. And the adults and the children learned together. So just imagine if he said run 10 miles, whether you were nine years old or 19 or 29, you ran 10 miles. You know what I mean? Just imagine if he said, and you've never done a knuckle push-up in your life, 100 knuckle push-ups to warm up and those types of things. So um, I didn't last long, really, um, because that type of training was too hard on me as a kid. But when I came to this country, I got back into martial arts training, and I never really looked was just like – I realized, wait a minute, you know, I got a skill set to hurt somebody. And so it became very, you know, when you're young and you're dumb, it can become very intoxicating when you just like, oh, no, nah, that's not going to work. You try that with me and I'm going to hurt you really bad. You know what I mean? And those are scenarios that you play in your mind. So it's just like I've always, martial arts has always been my go-to. It's always been my center because I know what I can do with it and I know the success that I've had with it. So it's always centered me, but it's also kept me very fit. It's always kept me in shape. It's always kept my body and my mind um, focused, so to speak. So like I was saying in my first statement, you know, you may not be able to do basketball and football your whole life, but this is something that you can do your whole life. And this is something that I intend to do, you know, because 
like I said, it's a part of me now. I'm always looking in ways to growing in my martial training, even at 47. No, that definitely makes a lot of sense. We're winding down, got about another four minutes to go in the show and everything. One of the things before Dean uh, pops in and gives us some of his thoughts and everything about what you've been sharing with us and everything that we'd love to have our folks do is let folks know how they can reach them and everything. So if folks are wanting to reach you either to learn about the real estate, learn about the books and how to get the books, or even to learn about your concepts about resistance training and martial arts, how would they be able to reach you, George? And another thing that I love having our uh, different guests do is give their words of encouragement. Because like I said, this is an audio podcast, but we do have listeners from around the world and all of that. So any words of encouragement that you would like to share just with our audience in general is something that I'd like to offer to all my guests on all the various platforms that I'm part of. But definitely any words of encouragement that you want to share, but also how folks can reach you. Thank you. I greatly appreciate that. I can be reached on my author website at George Boley Jr. G E O R G E B O L E Y J R dot com to learn a little bit more about me. All my social media links are there. And words of encouragement. Don't give up. Don't give up. Take everything one step at a time, but know that you can do it. I'm talking to you now when everybody told me that I wasn't going to do this. I'm talking to you now when people told me that this house I'm talking to you from, they told me I would never buy this house because of this wasn't right or my this wasn't right. And guess what? I'm talking to you from this house that they said I was never going to buy for my family. So be your own champion. The knowledge is there. If you don't know it, go find it. Educate yourself. You know. Don't be afraid to fail spectacularly. Why? Because in some of those failures are going to be some of your great lessons. No, no doubt about that. Hey, Dean, you want to jump in and give some of your thoughts as we're winding down? I'm seeing as I did pop into the room that the clock is at the two-minute mark. But if you want to jump in and share some of your thoughts before we talk about what else we've got on the network and where they can hear the replays and all of that. But I'm sure you've got some words of wisdom, words of thoughts that you'd like to share with Brother George. I don't know. He, I think he covered everything in there, man. We we got a lot of work to do. And the the fight and the struggle for the rights for social justice, and they continue, you know. Whereas we may get two steps forward, sometimes we get eight or nine steps back. But we still have to, you know, lean on our elders and learn from what they did and take it a step further. The baton has been passed to us now. So now we have to do uh, and set a good example for those that come behind us, because one day we're going to have to turn and pass that baton on. So, you know, outstanding conversation, man. And we appreciate you for being with us this evening. All right. Oh man. I yeah, appreciate you guys appreciate having George me. For be- Yeah, definitely appreciate George for being on there and sharing his wisdom. And before we get to the uh, last part, which is, like I said, Dean will mention some of the places that this show airs and everything. What is your thoughts about where both you and Dean are at? So I know he's oftentimes talking to me about New Jersey to North Carolina. And George, you are in New Jersey. So what are your thoughts about your fair state of New Jersey? Oh, you know, New Jersey is great when it's warm. When it's cold, it's cold. (laughs) <laughs> get your shovel or your snowblower, Jack, because it's, it, when it comes, it's going to get It's you. real. <laughs> that's for sure. I know that's right. Yeah, definitely that's the – and who knows? Who, maybe he, uh, George is a fellow Baltimore Ravens fan, or maybe he decided to root for one of those New York squads or one of those – other squads up there. So we'll have to find that out among you two and everything because Dean is a diehard Baltimore Ravens fan. Baltimore's Ravens? Yeah, I'm, I'm still a Chicago Bears fan. I mean, ever since Walter Payton, man, I've just been hooked on that franchise. Um, wrong with you know, I know they haven't done, I know they haven't done, you know, anything since Payton, quite honestly, but, you know, I'm still part of that, you know, that that mm-hmm. that franchise because of that. You know, I'm not going to jump ship to the team that's doing better now. No, Walter Payton had me. You know, I don't think that that type of 
performance is going to be duplicated at least in my lifetime for his abilities and the things that he had. So, yeah, man, I'm still a Chicago Bears fan. Well, my All younger right. brother will be glad to know that. He's a diehard Chicago Bears fan as well. So my younger brother Malik has been rooting for them ever since the Brian Oldbacker days of terms of defense okay. and everything. But I am a diehard Minnesota fan, and I'm like you, a lifelong fan, been a fan ever since the Fran Tarkenton days. So I just kind of dated myself. So definitely been a fan since the Fran Tarkenton days. And I'm not going to abandon my squad if they've been my squad all my life. So, like I said, I'm one of those folks that believes in staying with your squad. Now, there are some exceptions. I have moved around in basketball. But in that case, I'm following a particular individual. So, like I said, I was rooting for the Clippers because Doc was there. And now I'm rooting for the 76ers because Doc Rivers is there. And I went to school with Doc. So, I do kind of root for my basketball squad based on uh, some connections that I might have in terms of alumni and things of that nature. But in terms of my football and my uh, baseball, it's lifelong teams, that being the Minnesota Vikings and the Milwaukee Brewers. But definitely was glad that you were able to be on the show. Definitely found the conversation quite enlightening, and hopefully we can get you to come back on in the near future to share more of your wisdom. As always, was glad to have guests come back whenever they're able to on more than one occasion. So do know that you are welcome to come back whenever you're available and share any other wisdom that you want to share or if there's anything shaking in the real estate market or even in the martial arts uh, arena that you want to share with our listeners, know that you are always welcome to use this as a platform to call back on. And on that note, I'm going to let Dean tell folks where they can hear this show re-aired as well as what other folks we've got on this platform that's part of the next level thing going on. So Dean, it's on you. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Straight Talk with Dean and Mark, Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to catch our replays on the Skyhawk Radio Network tomorrow afternoon and Wednesday afternoon, both at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you miss those, then we got replays on a whole bunch of platforms, such as Radio Public, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, Tune in, Stitcher, Podbean, Apple Podcast, Pod Chaser, Podcast Addict, Castbox, Pod Follow, Deezer, Jay Saving, and right here on Blog Talk Radio, where we are part of the Level Podcast Network, where you can catch other exciting shows such as the Black Girls Guide to Surviving Menopause, the Chef Gang Radio Show. Funk from the front seat. Funk music with Zach. Learning unwrapped. Let's K12 better. Marketing with Rush. Hashtag Rush Selfie. Mona Shake in the Minority Reports. Mullings Music and Memories with Mark Lee. The Online Dinner Party with Mark Lee. The Planet Good Seed Podcast. The Reinvention Road Trip. She's on Call. The Just Podcast. The Mark Lee Show, The Spinach Social Hour, Virginia Interfaith Live, WNC Original Music, and of course, us right here, Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. Like I always say now, when you walk outside your front door, it's showtime and the world is your stage. Just make sure that people are not watching the rehearsal. With that being said, it's the six man Dean Geronimo. Have an outstanding week. <laughs> we see y'all in seven days. That's right. In seven days, we'll try to have some more amazing guests to come join the conversation and all of that. And we'll have another enlightening conversation both here as well as on our streaming teaming uh, shows that you hear aired on the uh, Level Podcast and Network and all of that. So definitely you can hear it in the audio version or you can watch me in the video audio version over there at IBMTV.TV and all of that. And I understand, Dean, that Russ had reached out to me, and I'm going to have my Russ moment as well. I think we're looking at either nice. this week or next. I can't remember which day he told me that, but he did tell me that he wants to do one of those Russ selfies with me the way he did one with you. So I think we're looking at either this week or next week, but it is coming up soon that I will have my moment in the, the Russ sunlight and all of that, just <laughs> like you had as well. So he's already reached out to me, so he's going to have both members of 
this team and everything straight talk. So he's already had Dean, and now he's going to have me on as well. So looking forward to that and looking forward to our having that conversation in the, the next, uh, like I said, either the next couple of days or within a week or so. But definitely it is in the immediate plan to make that happen. And I'm looking forward to it. And I know it'll be a fun time had by all. And I've actually also appeared on the World Economic Forum out of Malaysia. So my good friend, Sharif, has invited me to be a guest for a second time on that platform. So he's reached out to me using StreamYard and he does his show at, I think it's 11 p.m. their time, which means that it's like 10 a.m. our time. And I think that that's scheduled for either Wednesday or Thursday of this week. But they had a real good conversation last week about consumerism and about how consumerism impacts a lot of our day-to-day life, even in this COVID age. And I forget what this conversation is that's coming up, but I'm sure to be enlightening. They got a little heated on their conversation because there was one guy that was saying some things about inflation and he might have been a little bit more conservative, whereas there was definitely another guy that was a straight up libertarian and uh, they were getting a little loud and yelling at each other. I was not used to that. You know, I'm used to the friendly fire kind of conversation, but they were having a enlightening and fun conversation. And I'll see if those fireworks happen again this time around. You know, I'm not trying to be in part of any fireworks, but if they want to have them, I'll just check back on the side and let them do the fireworks thing. That's true. But hey, before the flame fizzles out on this joint right here, we got to bounce, man. This thing about to cut us off. <laughs> well, let's bounce. I'm out of here because actually my stomach is telling me that I need to bounce and find some food. All right. I'm out. See y'all next week. Peace.